Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> a very wise woman said, A virgin birth, I can believe that. But three wise men, that's hard to believe. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree. There are some guys out there that aren't so wise. <laughs> but a virgin birth I can believe. As we've been going through Matthew chapter 1, we've been looking at the genealogies. The first 14 generations of Jesus Christ were dealing with the patriarchs, Abraham, Jacob, those patriarchs of the Jewish people. The, the next 14 were dealing with the kings of Israel. David and Solomon and these wicked kings that came about. And then the next 14 generations dealt with the unknown men who basically were doing nothing. They were kings who had no thrones. And all of this, Matthew, was leading up to the birth of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, that is Jesus Christ. And so this morning's message is the birth, the birth of Jesus Christ through this humble, beautiful, young lady mary matthew and luke tell us of this birth and even the childhood of jesus christ narrating for a different reason but yet telling the same story and so drawing from those two gospels we get a picture of the birth and the life of jesus christ in a more fuller sense and so matthew starts in verse 20 in verse 18 through 25, in verse 18, he gives us, in a sense, the outline of the rest of the chapter. And then he kind of defines verse 18 for us in 19 through 25. And so in verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follow. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And so he gives us this, this synopsis, this summary of Jesus Christ's birth uh, after his mother Mary was betrothed or married to Joseph or engaged to Joseph before they had a relationship with one another. And this birth was of the Holy Spirit. I have that highlighted in my Bible because I think that's important. The main point of Matthew here is the birth of Jesus Christ. He's speaking to the Jews, remember that. And so he gives them the genealogy. And now he gets to the point, the birth of Jesus Christ. The evidence has been given to you. He is from the genealogy of our ancestors. And so this is who he is. He was born of the Holy Spirit. Now Matthew will give us details around his birth, like who Mary is and what she went through, who Joseph is and what he went through. But the main point is the birth of Jesus Christ and that he is God in the flesh and that he came to die for our sins. And so there's no other way for Christ to be born but to be born of the Holy Spirit. Highlight that in your Bible. He's not a man, but he was born of God. He came from God to be the holy sacrifice of God if he had been of a sinful father, an earthly father, then how could he take my place upon the cross if he had his own sins to deal with? And so he was born a man to walk this earth like us, but born of a woman that he might be human. And he was not a man, though, that he might not be sinful. He was born of God, sinless, from his birth until his death upon the cross. Matthew says, after his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, his relationship to his mother, who was betrothed to Joseph. Joseph and Mary were not having that intimacy that a normal marriage had at that point. See, the engagement aspect of a Jewish wedding and a uniting of two individuals is a lot different than ours is today. Back then, in that culture, they grew up very fast. They didn't have television. They didn't have video games. They didn't have distractions. They learned to work. They learned to cook. They learned to, to plow. They learned to plant vineyards and so forth and things like that. They grew up very fast. 
And so they would take the time to speak to the other parts of their tribes and they would make arrangements uh, for their children, usually anywhere from four to five years old, as young as three. And they would get together and say, my son will marry your daughter and they'd make an arrangement. And so they would keep that arrangement, they pay that dowry, and when they become of age, somewhere around 13 to 15 years old, they would then keep that arrangement. And that's where Mary and Joseph were. They were engaged. There are basically several steps to that. First was the engagement or the arrangement that the parents made. Then there was the espousal. And that's where they're just coming out. They're still young. They're not really connected yet. But they yet they know and they understand. You know, they go to school and, and they say, who's that? Well, that's my future wife. Well, how do you know? Well, because we've been arranged already and I'm going to marry her someday. And so they were in that stage and now they're entering the betrothal one year before they actually have the ceremony, that marriage arrangement. And then they consummate that marriage after that year. The only way to get out of that are two ways. One <clears throat> is your spouse dies. And thus, if you're a woman and he passes away before you consummate the marriage, then you are considered a virgin widow, yet never having consummated that marriage. Or if there's spiritual unfaithfulness or adultery or some sort of infidelity in that relationship, then you would go and get a certificate of divorce. You'd have to prove that your wife was unfaithful to you. What they would do is the father of the bride when they consummate that marriage, he would literally take the sheets to show that it was evident that they had consummated that marriage. And he would hide the sheets away just in case that the husband decided down the road that he did not want to be married to her any longer. And he would say, you know what? I don't think she was a virgin. I want a divorce. And so the father would come along and he would say, no, here's the evidence. You're lying. And so you have to keep her as your wife as evidence. And I think that's where we are with Joseph in marriage as they were engaged. Now it says that they were before they came together having that sexual relationship. She was found. She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Whoops. Imagine being there. Here you are, this whole arrangement, and then all of a sudden, Mary, who you've never known, never had a sexual relationship with, tells you, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Imagine what's going on in his head. And this pregnancy is of the Holy Spirit. That is, God took his seed, and through the Holy Spirit, he laid it into the womb of Mary. Now, the Jews understood the work of the Holy Spirit. We go back to Genesis and we find the Holy Spirit working. He hovered over the earth and he created the heavens and the earth. We, we saw that the creation of man, I think it was Job that said the spirit of the God had made me. Job 33, 4, he breathed life into me. And so the Holy Spirit has always played an active role in creation. So yeah, it makes sense that the Holy Spirit would hover over Mary and lay God's seed in her womb. And we have verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Now we come to the details. He gave us the summary of how it took place. Now let's get down to details. Who is Joseph? Joseph, her husband. We don't know a lot about Joseph. Uh, We know a few things. We know that Joseph had went with Mary to Bethlehem. When Jesus was born there in the inn, we know that uh, he was there in the temple when they presented Jesus as a baby. We know that he planned the whole flight to Egypt and Nazareth. We know that he was a carpenter. We know that's what he did by trade. We know that at the age of 12, when Jesus was in the temple about his father's business, Joseph was there. But other than that, we don't know much about Joseph. He seems to just disappear. We don't hear a lot about him. We know some of his responsibilities, but that's about it. All we know is what Matthew tells us and what Luke tells us. And according to Matthew, he describes his character as a just man here. Now, the just man means a straight and compassionate man. Now, those two characteristics go together. You can't have one without the other. You have to be straightforward You have to know what truth is and you have to believe in that truth and live by that truth. But you also need to have compassion, humility, 
Those are good qualities to have. And that was Joseph. He was a man that was straightforward, but yet very compassionate towards Mary. He knew what the law said. He knew what could happen to her. He knew what could happen to him. But yet, in his heart, he had this love and compassion for Mary. Notice what he says in the next statement, and not wanting to make her a public example. How would they make her a public example? Well, there's been some writings that they would take people that had committed adultery, and they would take them, and they literally put them in a box of manure, and they would bury them up to their knees. And then the people would stand back with stones, and they would stone them until their face hit the manure. And it was a public humiliation. Uh, it would definitely make you think about committing adultery you know, yourself, right? You wouldn't want to be facing manure one day if you got caught. You know? But because of Roman law, and we know this to be true, the Romans came and they pretty much did away with, with the um, judgment of the Jews to uh, bring about capital punishment. And so what the Jews did was, instead of stoning them, they would humiliate them. So, you know, the the gossip rumor would just start spreading. Did you hear about Joseph and Mary? Did you hear that Mary's pregnant? Who's the husband? Did they have a relationship when they weren't supposed to have a relationship? Did she go out and have a relationship? Who's the guy? And so they became, you know, humiliated through society, shunned from society. In fact, their chances of getting married probably were thin. They probably couldn't get married because of the humiliation who would want to marry them they're adulterers and fornicators and so forth put yourself in joseph's spot for a minute we'll we'll put ourselves in mary's spot in a second but put yourself in joseph's spot how would you react in that type of situation you know you didn't lay with your engaged wife you know it wasn't your child it was someone else's child But Joseph's response was one of straight and compassionate. He knew the truth. He wanted to live by the law. And he was a just man. He was a perfect man, in a sense, you could could say. He was a perfect man, did the best that he could. Wanted to to stand by his wife and, and wanted to do what was right. And yet he had the compassion. Two qualities that go together quite well. I was reading an article about a man. His name was Heath White. <clears throat> and this guy was a perfectionist to, to the extreme. Uh, my wife said that he was kind of like me. I said, okay, I don't think I'm perfect, but I sure get on myself if I'm not. This guy in high school was like, just, just really outdid everybody. He felt like he was it. He was above everybody. He was better than everybody. He knew stuff more than anybody. He went on to college and he graduated 4.0 compared to everybody. He was so good that the Air Force came to him and said, we'd like you to fly our jets. And so he took that job and he graduated the top of his class as a pilot. The FBI came in and said, we'd like you to work for us. And so he took that job. He felt as though... God had something great for him to do. That's how he felt. That's how I feel sometimes. You ever feel like that? Like God has something great for you to do. That's a perfectionist. He has a child, a girl, beautiful daughter. He takes up running, starts winning medals in his running, loves running the 5K, 10K runs and so forth. Perfectionist all the way. They have a second child. The doctor sits him down and he tells the couple that this child is missing the 321 chromosome which means that your child has down syndrome he said that when he said that he turned around and walked out the door in disgust in shame he started thinking to himself what is wrong with me that i would have a child with down syndrome what are people going to think about me? What are they going to think about me? I've done everything perfect. God has great things for me. And now I created a Down syndrome kid. No, this can't be happening to me. No, stuff like this doesn't happen to me. 
So he talks to his wife and says, you need to have an abortion. She thinks about it for about an hour and says, I'm not going to have an abortion. He quits running. He gets into depression. He's, he, he's just consumed with what people will think about him. And so he tries for the next two months to convince her to have an abortion. She doesn't do it. They have the child and he is forced to confront the situation. <clears throat> One day he goes into her room and like fathers do, they tickle and blow into baby's tummies, you know? And when he did that, the baby giggled and laughed and smiled at him. And he said that just changed his whole outlook. He just looked at the baby and it was like the Down syndrome was gone. It was just gone. And so he decided that he was going to invest some time into her. And so he began to take her with him when he ran. And he would run and he would run, never winning first place. He would put her in one of those those uh, strollers that runners use, you know. Never win first place, but he would show her off. He even got tattooed across his chest, Down syndrome. He wanted to show the people and the baby that he loves her very much. And this is what he said at the very end. <clears throat> he said, I have decided to perfect my love for her. Perfect my love. I thought, wow, wow. How many of us are perfectionists? I'm a perfectionist. And we can have the truth and we can be straightforward, but without love, what are you? What does Paul say we are? We're those symbols that just <laughs> make a bunch of noise. We're nothing without love. You want to be perfect? Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and then love your neighbor as you love yourself it's not like when you're learning to love yourself no as you love yourself because he already knows we love ourselves way too much and so love your neighbor as you love yourself and when you do that when you're perfect in that you fulfill all the law how important is love very important without love we're nothing Without love, we don't connect to God. Yeah, we have truth. Yeah, we understand it. But we're nothing without love. Joseph had the love. He had the compassion. He was right. He understood the consequences. But he didn't care. He was going to do what was right. So he was thinking of putting her away secretly. But what happened? Look at verse 20. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Again, the second time that he uses that phrase there. Joseph was given some special insight. An angel appears to him and says, Joseph, don't fear. Don't worry. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things going on out there. A lot of concerns for you. A lot of pressure, but, but don't think about those things. I'm doing a work. I'm bringing about the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he is the son of David. A reminder to Joseph that he comes from the lineage of King David and to the reader that Jesus is the Messiah because Matthew is writing to who? To the Jews, right? He's writing to the Jews. And so he reminds them that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the king of David. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't be concerned. I'm sure that Mary probably worried quite a bit, don't you think? Think about Mary, how she felt. Okay, how am I going to tell Joseph that <laughs> I'm pregnant and yet I've never laid with a man? Like, this is impossible. This is divine. This is God. I mean, I'm going to have to trust in God that God will somehow bring that point across to Joseph so that he doesn't abandon me. The whole issues of abandonment, you know, all of those things. Isn't it interesting how we feel? I, I, I ask my, my wife quite often when I'm hugging her, I say, do you feel secure? And she goes, yeah. When you put your arms around me, because you know, I'm like big and buff and... You know. <laughs> No, and I go, yeah, I can see how you're secure. <laughs> no, I don't get it personally. 
I'm like, you mean me putting my arms around you, you feel secure? She goes, yeah, I just, I don't know. It's just, like, how is that going to secure you? It's not like putting, you know, a, a plate of four-inch thick metal around you that will keep you safe. It's just the feeling, you know, that emotional connection that's there. I mean, we could be both wiped out by a semi just like that. <laughs> You know, but it's that sensation when you're connecting, when there's a peace and a rest. That's how women get. I don't get it completely. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, she she hugs me and I'm like, yeah, you're smothering me. <laughs> you know, I don't feel secure at all. In fact, I feel vulnerable. You know, I remember one time we were. Oh, I'm getting into high school stories. Never mind. <clears throat> I, I was in a in a fight and. Uh, because we've known each other since junior high. And she tried to get into the fight. You know, I'm like, get out of here. Leave me alone. Come on. Like, my girlfriend's beating up the guy. I'm like, that can't happen. <sighs> that doesn't make us feel secure. When, dun dun, dun your wife comes to your, well, girlfriend comes to the rescue. You know, not at all. It's, it's just totally different. To her, that's how she felt. You know, she needed that security. She needed that connection from Joseph. That's a fear, right? That's a fear on her part completely totally understood the angel told joseph for that which is conceived is conceived of the holy spirit and she will bring forth verse 21 a son and you shall call his name jesus for he will save his people from their sins now this is an interesting verse here i was really blown away by this whole verse here that joseph would name him Jesus now it doesn't say that he named him Jesus though the Jews had a custom and tradition the father always named the child that was always it remember Elizabeth and Zacharias you know and she finally said well let's ask him that's the tradition Joseph's not the father who's going to name the child Go back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. When God calls the Savior, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, it says the Lord will call his name. Whose child is Jesus? God's, the Lord's. And so the Lord names him. Boy, is that evidence of Jesus' Messiahship and that he is God? That just blew me away right there. That's the evidence that we've been looking for to connect Jesus. The Father, God, has the right to name this child. And because he is the Father, he names him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph just kind of went along and says, yeah, that's his name. You know, I'm not the Father. But that's the name that God has chosen for him. And so God names him. And it says, for he shall or will save his people from his sins. So if he's God, if he's the savior of the world, Jesus means Yeshua, Joshua, God saves or God with us. So God comes to save us from what? From our sins, the sins of the world. So that this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Matthew says. And of course he's quoting uh, Isaiah here. And Matthew does that quite often and we'll see that as we go through. Ten other times, he quotes the Old Testament as evidence of Jesus being the Messiah. <clears throat> and in this case, it's Isaiah seven fourteen. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Who will call his name Emmanuel? The Lord shall call his name Emmanuel. And so exactly what uh, Matthew quotes here in verse 23 is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The virgin shall be with child. Now, she's a virgin. Some have suggested that she was not a virgin because if she's a virgin, then that means a miracle took place here, right? Because how can a virgin get pregnant without laying with a man? Well, guess what? She can't. And so some secular scholars have taken the word Alma and which means young maiden, and they replace that word virgin with young maiden so that it reads, Behold, the Lord will give you a sign. A young maiden will conceive and bear a son. Well, what kind of sign is that? That's not a sign. 
The young maidens are always having children here and there, so that really isn't a sign at all. Matthew is taking the word from the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, 70 scholars got together. When the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and because of the captivity to Babylon, Alexander the Great, the Greek culture came in, the Hebrews, the Jews began to speak Greek, and so they lost the Hebrew language. These 70 scholars got together and they translated the Old Testament into Greek so that the people could read the Old Testament book. And in that Septuagint, they used the word parthanos, which means virgin. And so these 70 scholars properly interpreted it as virgin. And so that's what the word means, virgin. And so it literally is a miracle. You see, there are people that are always trying to deny miracles. And when you don't believe in miracles, you don't believe that they're going to happen, then guess what? You have a limited view of God. Uh, You have a powerless God, in fact. There are Christians like that, that don't believe God can do great works. And we give up so fast because we don't put our faith and trust in God. We forget what God can do. He created the heavens and the earth, didn't he? He just spoke them into existence. So guess what? He can change your wayward child, right? He can do that. God, when Moses had the people at the Red Sea, didn't know what to do, and the people were complaining and murmuring, and Moses just, what, stuck his staff in, and he divided the sea. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. So if he can divide that sea, then guess what? He can open doors for you where doors would be normally shut. If you believe and have faith in him and trust in him, if God can rain food from heaven down so you can eat, well, wait a minute, I don't know if I believe that. See, you have a limited view of God. But if he can do that, then he can provide for you, can he? He can. If God can put himself in a seed through the Holy Spirit, laid in the womb of a young girl and be born, what can God do? With God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. That's the God we serve. That's the God we should believe in. And so when you're up against the fence or the wall or whatever it is you're up against, you know, don't stop believing. Don't have a lack of faith. Trust in God. Lay it in his hands and say, Lord, this is yours It's not my problem. It's your problem. You need to deal with this. I'm not going to deal with it because I will mess it up. I will get in the way. I need to let you have it completely and watch what he'll do with it. But you've got to have faith that he can do it. Without faith, you're unable to please God, the Bible says. And so we need to have faith that he's able to do it. And so the son, you'll bear a son, And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That's the whole meaning of Christmas, right? God with us. That's what makes it special. You look at the genealogies. Were there any special births there? Abraham, maybe Jacob, but they weren't very special. They were normal births that took place. No, Jesus was the only special divine birth that took place here. The whole purpose of Christmas is to remember what Jesus has done for us. God being born, becoming flesh, and walking among us. That's an amazing thing. God himself. But we forget the meaning. We forget the purpose of Christmas. We're too busy with too much other stuff. When I was working for Southern California Edison, I used to test and calibrate the meters on homes. So I I actually worked this area, so I tested a lot of meters in these homes. And oftentimes the meters are usually on the side of your house or in the back wall of your house. In this case, the meter was on the, uh, when you're facing the house on the left side of the house. So I had to go through the yard and come around the other area. Well, this was an area that wasn't used a lot. In fact, you can see the weeds and the old grass and you can see pieces of wood laying all over the place. Well, I, all of a sudden I looked and there was an old manger. There's a little manger, you know, the little beautiful ones with Jesus laying in it and Mary and Joseph, and they were all painted, but this manger was thrashed. I mean, it had cracks in it, the weather had beaten it, the paint was gone, and they're just laying there. And and I'm looking at this like, wow, what a shame. But what an analogy of how Christmas is viewed today. 
So many times, Christmas can get old and ugly. We forget the meaning of it, the purpose of it. We get grumpy. We get upset. Where are we going to go now? What are we going to do there? How long are we going to stay there? I mean, just all of these things that have to do with Christmas. We lost the meaning. Or we feel like um, it gets really ugly. You go to the stores and people are looking for one thing, the best deals, the biggest gifts. And they're pulling and they're tugging and they're fighting for a tie for their husband or that little thing that they want or that one thing they're hoping that they will get. And it gets ugly and it gets forgotten. We forget the meaning of what Christmas is all about. We need to get back focused on why we're here. Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel Lord commanded him and took him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. He called his name Jesus. See, the focus point is Jesus on Matthew's part here. I've given you the genealogies. I've given you the evidence. Here's the scenario. It's about Jesus and what he has done for us. He has forgiven us of our sins if we will come and humble ourselves before him. It's about God with us. That's the focus and the center of our lives is Jesus. And that just isn't the case to so many. Some people will put the focus somewhere else. Mary or Joseph, but not Jesus. We do that with ministry. I can do that in ministry. I can get the focus off of Jesus and get the focus on ministry. It's easy, I I, I do it almost all the time and I've got to come back to worship the Lord and sit at his feet and praise him because he's my savior and I love him. But I can get so busy with ministry and events and things that I forget Jesus. I forgot prayer this morning. Randy said he reminded me but I don't remember him reminding me. I was talking with someone, he must have said prayer and I didn't hear him, we just kept talking. And I knew something was wrong. You know, you get that feeling I'm missing something here. Then I realize, he goes, hey, you missed prayer. I'm like, what? How did I miss prayer? How come you didn't remind me? We can do that. We take the focus off of Jesus. You can do that in ministry. You can be a part of ministry, and it's my ministry. Don't touch it. My, 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 my. Like that little cartoon with Donald, um, Daffy Duck. My pearl, my pearl, leave it alone. Don't touch it, you know? And it's not your ministry. It's God's ministry, and he's the center of that ministry religions have taken the focus off Jesus and put the focus on Mary. That's unfortunate because Mary took the focus off her and put it on Jesus. You you read her song in Luke chapter two and she talks about Jesus being her savior, that she has a need of a savior. That means she was a sinner and she needed Jesus too. But people will take her picture and put a statue and paint these wonderful gold flames coming out of her and and Jesus holding her up and lifting her and giving her honor. You go to the Philippines and they're literally parading her around. They're throwing fruits and coins and jewels on her. That's worship. That's a form of worship. They're lifting and the attention is being drawn to her. People put the attention somewhere else instead of Jesus. Could be on Joseph, but nah, who's Joseph? We don't know much about him. Couldn't do it, but the enemy can put it on Mary. She's a perpetual virgin, some religions say. That means that once she had Jesus, she never had a relationship before, but the Bible says otherwise. It says here in verse 25 that he did not know her till after the birth till after the birth. And then when you go to (coughs) Matthew 12, 46 and 47, Matthew 13, 54 through 56, John 2, 12, John 7, 2 through 5, Acts 1, 14, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Galatians 1, 19, all talk about Jesus' brothers and sisters. Well, that's a lot of areas to talk about his brothers and sisters. Get the CD afterwards and look those up. I didn't have the time to do that this morning. But we take the attention off Jesus. 
We can even put the attention on ourselves. It's about me. I'm the perfect man. You know? I'm perfect in everything I do. And we get it off Jesus, who is the perfect one. They call him Jesus. Let me close up with this. Summarize this event here. Jesus Christ was different from that any other Jewish boy that was born in his genealogy. Matthew points out that Joseph did not beget Jesus. Joseph did not beget Jesus. It was God who beget him. Joseph basically was the husband of Mary, and he is the one that agreed with God that he would be called Jesus. Jesus was born to an earthly mother without a need of an earthly father. And that's what we call the virgin birth. That's the doctrine. You and I were born into the world as sinners and Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save us. He came to make us his children because he loved us so much. And so in a sense, we are the Down syndrome kids. We're not perfect. You know, in that story, people were trying to make um, Heath White feel better. They, they would tell him, well, she doesn't look like she has Down syndrome. And he would respond like, well, I don't know what you're looking at, but she's got Down syndrome. But that turned into such a great love that he plastered it with a tat on his chest. That's the love Jesus has for us. Yeah, we're a bunch of people that have Down syndrome. But Jesus loves us so much. He loves you. And he wants you to come home. The Lord's been really laying this on my heart. You know, sometimes we can get wayward. We can walk away or run away and we can forget to make Jesus the center of our lives. And I think this Christmas, God wants us to come back to him because our society is losing that. We really are. And what's going around this world and in our country, but just with the church itself, just with the church itself, the turmoil that the church is in, this whole new culture that's around, we're not connecting with God anymore. There are churches now that are being very intellectual and it's good to be taught good and have good doctrine, but all it is is up here and it's not here. And we need to get back to here. That's where the Pentecostals came in, right? It was all here, but never up here. It was the other extreme. And as Calvary, we want to find the center. We want to have it here, but also connect here. And we're not doing that. And we see that with these off-site venues, that people are okay with that. Let's just go in and get out because it's up here. And this is a great teacher. I mean, he's awesome, no doubt about it, but that never connect. They never connect. We got to connect. We can't just have that intellectual relationship with Christ. We've got to connect. It's got to be life changing because that's what Jesus came to do, to change our lives, that we would become new creatures in Christ Jesus, that the old things would pass away and that all things would become new, that we wouldn't be that person that we were before, that we would put on a new man. That's what we want to do. What's that new man? Jesus Christ. I want to be like him completely. Do you think Jesus worried about his disciples? No. He knew exactly that his father was doing a work. Well, what about Judas Iscariot? He understood it completely. No, he trusted in the father completely. There was a plan that was unfolding and needed to come to its fruit, and Jesus understood that. Even though there were times where he doubted himself, yet he stayed on course and never doubted his Father in heaven. That's how we should be in our walk with him. Never doubting him, trusting in him, and keeping him the center of our lives. He will change your life completely. There's no other name given to us under heaven by which we can be saved. It's at the name of Jesus, and he will change you completely when you connect. I guarantee you, he will. There's just something about that. When he connects, boom, you're connected to God. That security thing that my wife feels, I can understand it from my relationship with Christ. Because I have this connection with God, I'm secure. I feel that security. I feel that confidence. Oh yeah, I can get depressed 
And I can look at life through my own lens from time to time, but when I stop doing that and look at through the lens of God, I know who I am in Christ. I'm his child. And he loves me, he loves you, and he wants the best for all of us completely if we will allow him that. Let's bow our heads. If I can have the worship team come forward. <clears throat> if you don't know Jesus Christ and this would be the first time that you've ever asked him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior, then I want to give you that opportunity. If you'll just raise your hand and say, I want Jesus. I want him to be in my heart. I might not understand everything, but I want him to be in my life and I will trust in him and him alone. If you want that, just raise your hand and I will pray with you to ask Jesus into your heart. Now here's the question that I think God is asking every one of us here is that Jesus is not the center of your life and this Christmas is a reminder of that. If he is not the center of your life, you need to repent because that is sin. You've made other things the center of your life. Maybe it's Mary. Maybe it's Joseph. Maybe it's your ministry. Maybe it's a church or a man. No, you need to make Jesus the center of your life. And if you haven't done that, then I want to give you that opportunity. Just raise your hand and say, I want Jesus as the center of my life. I want to make sure that he is there, that he is the focus point. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because I know the Lord's ministering. You need to be open and willing. Thank you, Lord. And honest with him because you're standing before him and him alone right now. Is he the center of your life? Is he really the focus or is something else the focus? Your wife, your husband, get it off them. Get it on Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. All right, let me pray for you. Father, I, I pray for those who lifted their hands, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for their boldness, their sincerity, Lord, before you, that they would raise their hands and just agree, Lord, that they have taken you <clears throat> off that centerpiece, Lord, and put other things there, Lord. We want to lift them up to you right now, Lord. We want to ask for your grace and your mercies and restorating power, Lord, to just come upon them, Lord, afresh and anew. You're not a condemning God. You're a loving, caring God. And you love them so much, Lord. And so, Lord, help them. Fill them with your spirit, Lord. Help them to make you the center of their lives, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.